arrived, it was it was already um, entirely in flames. From when the first flame started to the thing being overtaken, it's roughly around about six minutes. Nothing anybody could really have done. It was gone, basically. It's heartbreaking, I think, is, is, the, is the big thing. I was in tears mostly yesterday and all, all night, the night before. I can't look at it. I, I just, I just paint it out, I just... Um, incredibly sad because this has been here for 25 years as a, as a, as a place, but obviously it's telling the story of people that were here two and a half thousand years ago. Staff in tears. I gave them a a talk about what this was would mean, and in the short term, but in the long term, you know, this 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 would be an opportunity. It's a horrible word to say, but we were going to move anyway. It's a bit daunting. Um, so we, we bought the new site for the new development and the plan was that we'd take it one step at a time and we'd get over each hurdle as you're doing these things and it can take years, we know that, and we'd set our stall out with, with, with one thing and another to get to get. We've done the first phase of the, of the business plan and we've got the initial master planning done, so we're, we're kind of on some sort of road. That needs to shift now. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but understand that there is huge doubt as well. Um, but we've probably got to accelerate the process a little bit if we're going to keep the team together. If we're going to make this happen, we need to see if it's possible to do things quicker. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank everyone who has sent us some messages of support um, donated to our fire recovery fund and generally boosted our morale um, at such an awful time. I will talk about the Cranog fire in a moment, but first of all, I'm going to give a background to our origins. Throughout the Iron Age, society in parts of Britain became more structured around hierarchies. There was an increased contact with the European continent and the population grew. Iron was far superior to the bronze it replaced, and it was a significant technological development. Scotland's landscape housed many self-sufficient farming communities, and the prehistoric people here also developed unique building styles such as brocks and cranogs. Cranogs are islands built at the edges of lochs in Scotland and Ireland. It is possible to see the submerged remains of cranogs from hilltops, or nowadays of course we can use a drone. One feature of lochs is that the water levels can rise and fall quite dramatically, depending on the rainfall, and it has been recorded that uh, some submerged cranogs do become visible and exposed in hot, dry summers. Wood might have been used as the main building material in heavily forested areas such as Perthshire, but in more barren areas such as the Hebridean Islands, stone would be favoured. Naturally occurring islands, if utilised in some way by humans, are also called cranogs. The earliest Scottish cranogs are Neolithic, they've been dated to around 5,000 years ago, and the latest constructed ones are medieval in date, although some cranogs have been interacted with and or modified in some way as late as the Victorian period. Man-made cranogs eventually collapsed into the water and formed mounds of material on the loch bed. These are called submerged cranogs. Natural island cranogs, however, can still be seen today covered in trees. A book called Ancient Scottish Lake Dwellings or Cranogs by Robert Munro was published in 1882 and it was the definitive publication on Cranogs until recent decades, following on from a 19th century fashion for exploring lake and pile dwellings in Europe and those first fledgling attempts at underwater archaeology that were carried out. Munro's book does still hold great sway, um, and it was the original notes in this book which inspired the Scottish Trust for Underwater Archaeology to survey the cranogs of Loch Tay, Loch Awe, and Loch Lomond. The survey of Loch Tay shown that there was potentially 18 cranogs in the loch. Uh, 
the largest was Priory Island. It's an artificial island constructed of boulders and it, you can still see it today very visible as a large, very impressive wooded island. King Alexander I's Queen, Sibylla, reputedly died on the island in 1122 um, and it's also known as Sibylla's Island because of this. The original name was the island of Loch Tay, but King Alexander gave it in perpetuity to the monks of Schoon Abbey so that they could build a church there in Sibylla's memory, and it's thought that this gave rise to the name eventually of Priory Island. The smallest crannog that we have here in Loch Tay is Milton Boathouse. It's a submerged artificial early Iron Age crannog. It comprises just a stone mound. Uh, and of course, for us, we have Oakbank Cranog. This was a submerged artificial island, um, and it was the Cranog that was chosen for excavation by the Scottish Trust for Underwater Archaeology, and it is early Iron Age in date. The first excavation of Oakbank Cranog took place in 1980 and sporadically over the years. Um, about 20% of it was excavated until the final excavation in 2007. On the strength of those excavations, a reconstruction of Oakbank Cranog was built and it opened to visitors in 1997, along with a small exhibition and accompanying demonstrations. The centre started out in a couple of porter cabins and gradually expanded over the years to include the buildings that we occupy today. This footage shows how underwater archaeology is carried out. Excavating an underwater site needs a lot of preparation and equipment. In the case of, of a submerged Cranog, a walkway is built leading from the shore to the archaeological site. Diving equipment, air compressors, generators and water pumps are housed on a platform at the end of the walkway. The hoovering that you can see in the video takes small items up to the surface and hose connected to the machinery on the platform above. It sucks the sediment away from the site to expose the archaeology beneath, but it also brings material up where it's filtered through a fine mesh screen floating on the surface of the water. This allows the tiniest of finds to be caught. Larger items are placed in a tray attached to a rope. Colleagues on the platform can then pull that up to the surface and immediately put the items in bowls of water to stop them drying out. The reconstruction of Oakbank Cranog took three years on and off with plenty of volunteer and specialist support. Research had been undertaken by a PhD student on the nature of the toolkit that the Cranog builders had at their disposal. We know that they had between five and ten iron axes and they did the bulk of the constructional work on the Cranog with these. The smallest blade of these axes was 45 millimetres wide and the biggest was 79 millimetres wide. 
Our reconstruction used axes in some of the work, but chainsaws were then used to speed up the process of building the house. The original Cranog's toolkit also comprised knives, gouges, chisels, hole boring tools and awls. The inside base of a butter dish has been tooled with the gouge, and we can even tell that the blade of that was curved in cross section of just over 23 millimetres in diameter. Now that would have been a very useful tool for hollowing out small vessels. Although it took us three years to build this reconstruction, we don't know how long it took the original Cranog builders to get the house to a stage where it was habitable. However, a single building phase may have taken a few months and it is important not to think of the house as being complete and then all work stopping. Building and repair works were almost certainly continuous. The original Cranog was probably thatched with bracken, although four tons of reed thatch was donated to us for our reconstruction. We now? Well, the Cranog Centre was incredibly successful for 20 years and it became not only an iconic feature of the Loch Tay landscape, but an established five star Visit Scotland visitor attraction. We are now an accredited museum with all the responsibilities that such a status brings a responsibility to look after the collections, the buildings, and the landscapes under our guardianship, a responsibility to engage communities and audiences, a responsibility to safeguard the collections for the communities of the future and of course, a responsibility to tell the stories of our resourceful and ancestral Cranog dwellers who two and a half thousand years ago built these fantastic structures and left us their treasures. The backbone of our ethos today is that of community engagement and delivering a museum with a keen sense of social justice. This approach has multiple strands from which form a healthy, powerful and cohesive whole and that ultimately future proofs our organisation. So at one level, we've developed a broad and diverse spectrum of partnerships within the sector and at a wider academic level. And that's led by acknowledging that the abundance of knowledge of expertise is always on the outside of any organisation. At the same time, we have increased the number of volunteer under and postgraduate archaeology students from just one in 2017 to 12 in 2021. At another level, we have established an apprenticeship scheme we had five under 18s starting SVQ of customer service apprenticeships with us in August 2020. And that brings obvious and many benefits, life skills and work experience are gained. You get younger non-graduate voices being heard within the work world of museums and archeology. span uh, And vitally they've become equals. They have responsibilities. They're just not a source of free labor. And I have to be quite emphatic about that. Each apprentice has a staff mentor, which means that we acquire five SQA assessors within our team as part of this process. And our aim is to become an accredited training centre for the apprenticeship scheme that will provide training and support to local organisations that might wish to embrace the scheme themselves. Now, such initi initiatives do have obvious and far reaching benefits. You can boost your local economy, you can help young people stay in the area and you can upskill everyone involved. And that's just a few of the benefits. Yet another strand involves enhancing the visitor experience itself. 
passive visit passive visits are being supplemented with more and more hands on activities and learning through doing and we've begun to deliver a calendar of immersive workshops this enables us to generate income in really diverse ways in within four years we have increased our visitor dwell time from 45 minutes to between two and four hours and that's quite something in order to keep the Cranock experience egalitarian though we haven't uh, increased entry fees in any way, but for those who can afford to do so and want to show their appreciation of the extra experiences that we've put on, they can do that through donation boxes that we have all throughout the site. As a result of that, we have increased our donations fourfold in 10 years. Our regular tour content was a tried and tested successful formula. It started in the museum. Visitors could see the original artifacts from the excavations of Oakbank Cranog, sometimes involving a pop-up curator or object handling session. Visitors could also go then into our compound where under canvas shelters, we demonstrated green woodworking, pottery, textiles, food and drink. And we also had optional extras in the outside areas, including puppet shows for the time of season when we knew that young families were more likely to be on site, uh, trade talks on the beach and so on. Uh, and of course, every visitor went on a scheduled guide led tour into the Cranog for about 30 minutes. The problem is we have been compromised by our site for several years and our recent repositioning as a sector leading museum has highlighted some of the constraints of our site even more acutely. And this can be evidenced in the following ways. Firstly, the museum building is not fit for purpose for housing accredited accredited collections. It is a temporary, uninsulated kit building. It's over 20 years old now. We cannot control the environment to meet conservation standards, and therefore we cannot secure the long-term care of our internationally significant collection for future generations. The building is also insecure and it doesn't have space for immersive engagement or the capacity for growing and engaging our audiences. Also, overall, the site has many drawbacks which do not enable all year round opening, and that's going to be key both to our sustainability and to us playing a key central role in local e economic growth in the future. It's a small site which restricts our capacity to maximise the power of our collections through demonstrations, interpretation, experimental archaeology, special events and so on. And it's also a difficult site for disabled visitors to navigate. Before we lost the Cranog to the fire, having just one Cranog meant that we were forced um, to restrict access for schools, groups and individual visitors. Also, our story is of national significance and importance, and it's a central pillar of Scottish history. And our physical location and the layout of the site and buildings doesn't enable the sense of arrival that you would normally associate with such a significant story. Furthermore, we have a steadily expanding marina development adjacent to us, and over the years we've been swamped by this development. It's incongruous with the kind of environment, spirit and sense of place that we're striving to create, um, and that is definitely a problem. Also, another drawback relates to our lease. Uh, we have restrictions which, uh, to the lease which will not be changed. These make it impossible for us to fulfil income potential by providing a cafe, for example, uh, and that's going to be a level of customer care provision that is simply expected these days. There is also constrained use of the car park opposite the centre, which doesn't provide adequate coaching parking um, or uh, extra space for us to use on event days. There's also a narrow lane accessing our site and that doesn't have a footpath, so that makes walking to the centre from the Kenmore village uh, nearby quite dangerous. There is also very little affordable social accommodation for young people and employment and in training in the area and that limits the opportunities that we're keen to provide. Also, we don't have appropriate working environments for our staff and volunteers due to a, due to a lack of office and staff space. Um, the drainage and sewerage, this is important, the drainage and sewerage and the water facilities on our site, they are actually only of domestic grade uh, and that causes problems when trying to accommodate large numbers of visitors. So I suppose overall, our current buildings and the site are costing increasingly more to maintain. They're in energy inefficient, um, and that means that they have a negative impact on the environment. Um, that comes to talking about Delurb and our uh, ideas for a new site. Uh, we had initially begun to look into developing a new Scottish Cranock Centre um, well over a decade ago, but we started to, I suppose we started seriously to explore, explore the idea in the past three years when those constraints that I've just talked about became far more apparent and we realised that a new site would be essential to our survival. 
Um, we initially secured seed funding to appoint a creative consultant to draw up a business case. And in 2020, we did secure a four hectare picnic site called Delurb from Forestry Land Scotland through a scheme called Community Asset Transfer. Our model for the new centre championed social justice and it was firmly embedded within the local communities and within the social and environmental heritage. Um, and this was such a strong vision overall that we were granted the land, um, believe it or not, for a token sum of just one pound in June 2020. Delurb, if you don't know it, is located opposite the current uh, Scottish Crannog Centre on the north side of the Loch Tay. And initially we had a five year project sketched out by the creative consultant and an architect. The objects of that project were to secure the long-term future of the Scottish Crannog Centre, to care for, interpret and research our collection using academic rigour, immersive engagement and best practice, to create an organisation with lived values, strong governance and democratic decision-making, an organisation that was diverse and reflective, and to grow and nourish the 21st century Crannog community through meaningful relationships co-production and co-curation and skills exchange. We were going to be an organisation with heft, built on resilience and trust, an organisation that people wanted to work alongside and to support. And we were going to develop a site that sits in its locality, aware of its environment and its need to be a beacon of sustainability and an integral part of the stunning landscape of Loch Tay. This will be where we tell the, how, the story of how the early Iron Age Cranog dwellers made the most of the world around them. And we will do the same at Delurb in a sustainable way. Um, so that's, that was our vision for the new centre. Um, Delurb, when we purchased it, was currently a car park and a picnic site for visitors and residents. And people did used to use it to access the loch for wild swimming and for canoeing. We will keep those facilities available and maintained. So that was our five year plan that we had outlined with all those um, uh, those, those visioning um, uh, statements, um, the phased implementation of the development um, includes many aspects um, and those um, are still valid. We're still going to do these things. Firstly, what we're going to have at Delurb is a main building. It will incorporate a museum, cafe, um, gift shop and offices. Now this is going to be built through a modern museum and national indemnity standards. The space will tell our story, but it'll also enable us to loan treasures for other institutions um, and to hold temporary exhibitions. It'll be a place where we co-curate um, exhibitions and there'll be a place of research. It'll also be a place where there's a community hub, a cafe, gift shop offices, multi-purpose space, which we can use as an education base or hot desk in meetings, conferences, and so on. We are also going to build three Cranogs at Delurb with just run, one reconstruction Cranog on our existing site. Guided tours for school groups and coach parties and members of the public were severely compromised and this did impact on the experience. So we'll have three Cranogs. We'll build a Neolithic one, a Late Bronze Age, Early Iron Age one and an Early Medieval one. These will be based on archaeological evidence and importantly, they will increase our capacity for welcoming schools and groups and broadening their experience. And of course, we can also use them for evening events, learning spaces, performance arenas and so on. Uh, the idea is that they will be expert led, but community built. We'll have a woodworkers yard as well. This is going to be a purpose built area for construction and maintenance of the Cranogs and the surrounding Iron Age village. It will be an accredited training area for traditional skills, coppicing, timber framing, green woodworking and craft fellowships will be run there in partnership with HESS and with FLS. Our Iron Age village, well, we will recreate one surrounding a large roundhouse. This is going to be based on the popularity and the intimacy of our existing demonstration compound, but expanded and with a farm. The village will showcase the day-to-day -day lives of the Cranog folk, including hands-on activities and a greater number of ancient technology that in ancient technology demonstrations than we do currently. There will be a forestry interpretation area. Now, initially, this space was envisaged as a means to help FLS meet their engagement objectives, celebrating the Highland Perthshire landscape. But here, it, this is a good example of how um, quickly our plans have been evolving since discussions with various partners began. After several site meetings this summer, we've now entered into a service level agreement with Forestry Land Scotland 
whereby they will provide us with all the large required for building the Iron Age village in Cranogs from Drummond Hill, which is the FLS managed woodland behind Dunlop. And this is the oldest managed woodland in Scotland. It has a unique story of its own to tell, which we will do on Forestry Land Scotland's behalf. So we will weave the ecological and landscape narrative into the historical interpretation at the Cranog Centre. FLS will also provide us with some of the cleared land to plant and manage for our own purposes. Hazel coppice, for example, which will be done with interpretation, hands-on engagement and so on. And that means that people will therefore be able to visit Drummond Hill as a part of their visit to our new site. We will also build an artist's, artist's creatives studio space. This is going to be inspired by our stories. Artists in residence will work alongside collections and communities to develop a program of co-curated projects. Another example of how frequently our plans can evolve can be seen in a recent visit to the centre by Alison Phipps and Tawona Satole. Um, Alison is the UNESCO Chair of the Refugee Integration and Ambassador for Scotland Refugee Council. And Tawona is the UNESCO Ryla Art Re Artist in Residence. They paid us a scoping visit in August to explore ways of initiating a mutually restorative working relationship. And as of September, we're now exploring the potential twinning of our centre with the Amagugu International Heritage Centre in Zimbabwe. We will have small incubator startup hubs at Dalurb. Now these will provide goods for our own outlets as well as directly to the public. Um, and this supports our desire to run the new site along circular economy lines. We'll also have some affordable accommodation. One or two small low cost units will enable apprentices, volunteers, students and interns to join us for placements and learn the skills needed to become the workforce of the future. This is an area of high property prices and second home ownership um, so having these valuable people on our team is prevented at the moment by our rural location, minimal transport costs and that lack of affordable temporary housing. So the fire and the future, this is the important bit, I suppose. Um, uh, and I have to say that that was a very ambitious project, the Delure project, all of those elements um, nevertheless are going to be needed if we are to be sustainable in the future. Um, so we have to be absolutely um, clear here that the, the new Scottish Cranog Centre, it will create multiple opportunities for financial viability. And even within the historic experience itself, we are very mindful that what we offer has to be more than merely a passive experience. Um, taking the money, showing a few things, saying goodbye, that is absolutely not an option. Dwell time is going to be crucial for increasing visitor spend in the form of donations, cafe and gift shop. And we've already got increased average dwell time from one out of four in the past three years, as I said. Um, and that passive experience too has its limitations. In the past year, we've trialed and we've refined a series of day long workshops in subjects, including basketry, weaving, blacksmithing. And we even do a, a day in the life immersive Iron Age experience. So you can see how crucial uh, and economically viable that model has to be. And also that that would have been a five year plan um, to deliver all of those things and to make that an absolutely sustainable Scottish Cranog Centre for the future. Um, however, at 11 o'clock uh, in the evening, 11 p.m., Friday, the 11th of June this year, 2021, we had an absolutely catastrophic fire breakout in that 25 year old reconstruction of the Cranog. It was destroyed in just six minutes. You've got an image here that I'm going to show you. It shows the Cranog fire at its height. We had fire engines from Pit Lockery, Colin, Blair Gowrie and Perth. They were pumping water straight onto the lock, onto the walkway in a very successful attempt to stop the fire from spreading along the walkway and onto land. I have to say that the global outpouring of heartfelt feelings and the range of support was absolutely tre tremendous. It was hu um, humbling as well as life affirming. And I suppose what followed that fire um, was one of the most intense periods for everyone within our Cranel community here, volunteers and staff alike. We ended up working 12 hour days just to keep on top of the messages of support that were flooding in and requests for media interviews. We had to rapidly devise a reaction plan for reopening to visitors and to create a multi-agency task force to steer us through a phased period of recovery. Within five days of the fire, we had reopened to visitors and with a modified visitor experience and a 50% reduction on admission prices. Uh, we had hosted site visits by prominent supporters, sector leaders and politicians, 
um, a just giving crowdfunding appeal had been set up by our neighbours at Lochte Highland Safaris, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, and all, donations also came flooding into us directly via PayPal and cheque. And as a registered charity, charity, it took several days for our own Just Giving page to be set up. And we also had offers of support in the form of skilled traditional labour, thatchers and woodworkers, raw materials such as thatch, hazel coppice and bracken, building materials, earth moving machinery. We had marketing and project management professionals, general labouring and even raffles and sponsored walks and archaeological support from the museum sector and from as far away as Finland and Italy. Um, so donations themselves, they came in from as far away as Australia and the USA, and I have to say it was a truly global reaction to the fire. What you can see here are some of the burnt timbers which fell loose from the crannel because it was burning. The morning following the fire, we found these along with the thatch washed up against our shoreline. It's interesting to see that the thatch was merely singed by the fire. I think that might be because when the fire broke out, it created an enormous draw that was powerful enough to blow the thatch off from the inside out before it had a chance to burn properly. It's fascinating observances like this, which are going to feed into Hess's study of the Cranog remains and give us an idea as to how Cranogs and roundhouses burnt in history. Um, and I'm still waiting to hear from Hess as to when they want to start work on that uh, analysis of our Cranog remains. Uh, the other thing that we did in the immediate aftermath uh, of the fire was to work hard securing emergency fire recovery funding and we were delighted when our insurers accepted liability with no need to involve their forensic investigators. As well as the Cranog itself being insured, we also had business interruption cover. Um, even so, despite uh, successful fundraising and with that reduction in admission prices and without a Cranog, uh, the bottom line is that we are not financially secure and we can only on, operate now for a limited number of, uh, of months, uh, weeks even. Um, and this means that because of this problem, we've had to fast track those development plans that I've just described. And so we're now beginning uh, to look at creating the Iron Age village and a roundhouse on our new site, Dallur, by uh, beginning to start those next February with the foundations of the replacement Cranog going into the water as soon as the lock levels fall next spring. At this time of recording, we are still waiting to hear if we have the major funding support that will enable these plans to progress. If that's not forthcoming, we will have to stay on our existing site and build a new crannel here. Um, but that means that we won't be able to pursue development in the foreseeable future because basically we won't be given uh, grant funding twice over. Um, and so as our existing site prevents us from expanding and growing, we will ultimately close down. So I have to say, fingers crossed. I hope to be able to update you by the time we air at conference itself. Finally, I'd like to say that if any of you would like to support our fire recovery, that would be absolutely fantastic. That can be done via Just Giving, Facebook, Instagram, PayPal, or even an old fashioned check in the post. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Look forward to seeing you at conference and your questions. Thanks. <laughs>